Good morning, everyone. Haven't all the talks been amazing? That was pretty good. We're going to get louder. Hello! Thank you so much. Um, yes, I wanted to start off by talking about this book, which starts off with this scene from my life, which is that my mother, when I was growing up, would tell me and anybody else that would listen that I was the first artificial insemination baby in Australia. And I, I well, I know, I know. And I, I know you're looking at me and you're thinking, you're a little bit old for that, Richard. IVF only happened in the 70s. But she wasn't talking IVF. She was talking old school. She was talking turkey baster. And it is true, and I've checked this out, and it is true that if you look back in the history of artificial insemination, in 1958, when I was born, they were starting to use that traditional animal technology <laughs> to produce human beings, maybe like me. So it's possibly, it's actually possible that she is right about that. What was odd about it is the reason she gave for me being the first artificial insemination baby, and the reason she always gave, and again, she would tell anybody who cared to listen, was that she had never, ever, ever, not once, in her 13 years of marriage to my father, slept with him. The marriage was unconsummated. Uh, they lived in Papua New Guinea at the time, and they decided to come down to Sydney to have this novel procedure. Um, and uh, they, they used a society gynaecologist, that was part of the story, Professor Malcolm Coppelson. When I told that story in Mossman, half the audience had been born by him. So <laughs> But, um, you know, according to my mother, my father went into the little cubicle behind the curtain and produced the sperm, and my mother um, submitted herself to the procedure, and it worked. She was both a virgin and pregnant. <laughs> so if you want to call me Jesus, you know. <laughs> Uh, and what was weird is that, is that my father told a very similar story, slightly different. According to him, yes, they, they had never slept together. The marriage was unconsummated. Yes, they'd come down and saw Professor Malcolm Copleston. According to my father, they did it, but it didn't work, and they went back to New Guinea, and she was forced to sleep with him just the once in order to have me. And whichever story you believe, I find it hard to think of myself as a love child. You know? <laughs> But we came down from New Guinea after a while, and we went to Sydney, and then we went to Canberra, and life went on. They were very strange with each other, the, these two kind of quite narcissistic, indifferent people to each other, this difficult, unconsummated marriage, and, and quite indifferent and strange with me as well. But still, life rolled on until when I was 14. And if you think the artificial insemination story is weird, get this. Uh, when I was 14, my mother ran off with my English teacher from school. <laughs> who she'd met at parent-teacher. Now, I don't know why that makes it worse, but it does, doesn't it? I've been, I've been wondering why it makes it worse, and I think it is, it's just because you get a mental image, don't you, of, uh, yes, Richard's uh, Hamlet essay was very good. I gave him, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they ran away together. They ran up to, uh, they ran away to Armadale together, and we, we kind of left my life really uh, quite, quite thoroughly at that point. And my father was heartbroken. I mean, despite the unconsummated marriage, or maybe even because of it, he was absolutely obsessed with my mother. And so he left too. My English teacher left, my mother left, and my father went back to England. Now, he came back after a while, and he, in the interim after a while, he moved a friend of his in to look after me. But basically, for a while, I was just there on my own in this suburban house in Canberra. Now, this book is not Angela's Ashes. Everyone's got footwear throughout this book. And, and I'm not throwing myself on your sympathy because the house was quite nice. The house had a swimming pool and a, a chest freezer. And in fact, my friends used to love coming around to this house where there were no adults, just this only 14-year-old child on his own. Um, and they used to come around and we used to chat. And occasionally I'd get maudlin, you know, in that teenager way where you, all the problems of, well, it's terrible, my, my English teacher left and my mother left and now my father left. And, and one of my friends at the time, I remember, with, with, I think, unkindly accuracy, said, yeah, 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 Richard, you really never left home. Home left you. <laughs> some some, uh, some truth in that. Um, but 
you know, uh, my father eventually came back and I, I finished the, the HSC and all of that. And I did what a lot of young Australians do. I decided to go and visit the home country because I was an only child. I'd never met a cousin, ne never met a grandparent, never met an uncle. So I decided to go to England and see if I could meet all these people. And I got all the names and addresses from my father of all my relatives on his side. And then I rang my mother in the little uh, love nest with the English teacher and asked her for the details of my folks on her side, you know, my grandparents. And she refused. And she said, no, no, I, I won't give them to you. A and I asked why. And she told me this story, which I had heard a few times growing up, uh, but never paid much attention to it. And it was really for her the story that explained everything. She was born into this aristocratic British family, and there were that class of people. She understood this intellectually, but still, there were that class of people who sent their children to boarding school when they were just six years old. And you can imagine this little girl being sent to this posh, boarding school, and in her mind, it was in the effort to escape that when she was 16, that she sort of ran out of the gates of this terrible place and, you know, met my father who was, in 1945, you know, handsome naval officer in his uniform on the train, and she met him and she sort of threw herself into his arms and went as far away as she could from her parents to Sydney and then to Papua New Guinea. And, and all the, as she saw all the disasters of this loveless marriage and the turkey baster and all that, all due to her parents, so no, she would not give me their details. F fair enough? Fair enough. So I go to England anyway, and I see my, my father's sister, and it's a, a great time, and I'm meeting my cousins for the first time, and my young uh, girl cousins, and we go horse riding together in the south of England, and my auntie is fantastic, and it's a joyful time for me. But after, uh, you know, three or four days, Auntie Audrey says, oh, well, you know, you'll be going and seeing, seeing your mother's folks now. And I say, oh, no, Auntie Audrey, no. And she said, why, why? And I said, oh, she wouldn't give me the, you know, uh, because, you know, she went to the posh boarding school and, you know, and she was an only child and she felt very lonely and that was why she went to, ran out of the school gates and my father in the smart naval uniform and then, and then, and then the turkey baster, her, you know, <laughs> and then me. And as I'm saying this, this smile is forming on Artie Audrey's mouth and she's saying, only child, you say? I said, yes, only child, yes, yes. Posh boarding school? Yes, yes, posh boarding school, yes, yes, that's right. She says, would you like to see a picture of your mother and her family and her sisters? Her sisters? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. And so Auntie Audrey goes into her little house in, in, in Bath and goes up, upstairs. I can hear her rooting around in the cupboards and the drawers. And she comes, you know those little tiny black and white photographs they used to have? And she gives me one of this and, and, and hands it to me. And I'm staring at it. And I can tell, it's, I can recognise my mother. And clearly there are two other people who are her sisters. And, and, her, and I'm staring at this. And they're so clearly not posh. <laughs> they're, they're clearly British Northern working class. I mean, they're, they're British Northern working class as rendered by Monty Python. I mean, the father's virtually got a hanky on his head and a ferret down his pants. <laughs> and I, I, say, I say, oh, well, they, they look lovely, Auntie Audrey. And she says, oh, well, they were lovely. But she was embarrassed about them being working class. And so she wouldn't let them come to the wedding. And they came anyway, and they stood in the rain outside the church and threw confetti. And she said, that's the last time I ever heard them even mentioned. And it's the saddest image in the world, isn't it, of this woman who has decided to deny the very existence of her, of her sisters and deny the sort of reality of her parents. Not that my father was posh at all. He was northern working class as well, but maybe just slightly above, slightly above where I found out in the end my mother was from, because I then found out all about where she was from, and she was from this very impoverished background, from this, not a mansion at all, but this kind of tiny house. I, I, I kept that to myself, really. I, I went back to Australia, and I had my own family, and my mother was quite distant from me, uh, from me anyway. But you still, even though you know someone's living this strange kind of lie, you still want them to have a relationship with your children. They're their grandparents, for better or worse, aren't they? So I tried to do that, and I, I remember she would come into our lives maybe once a year, quite rarely, really. I remember when my youngest son was just 10 days old, my mother came to our place, and she was sitting on the couch, and I was, I was cuddling the baby, and I said, Oh, Mum, would you like to hold the baby? And she said, Oh, no, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. I couldn't hold the baby. And I said... And I put on that voice, you know that, that jolly hockey sticks voice we use when we're in deeply mad families, but we're trying to pretend everything's normal? <laughs> you know that voice? Oh, come on, Mum, you must have held me. <laughs> and she shook her head furiously and she said, no, I never did it. 
The natives did it. The natives. And look, she may well be right. We were in Papua New Guinea. And it's true that my father was an enthusiastic photographer. And there are hardly any photographs of me with my mother. We had to search really long and hard to find this one photograph of me and my mother. And as someone pointed out to me just the other day, it's a weird photo too. You don't often see a photo of a mother and a child where they're both staring out of the frame and not at each other. But there's a million photographs of me and Darnota, who is my Papua New Guinean nanny. And, you know, they're always, she's always cuddling me and holding me. And she's often pictured with her husband, Gogo, who's this very handsome Papua New Guinean warrior, bare-chested and fit-looking. And she's a beautiful Papua New Guinean woman with this beehive haircut. And they're often standing there proudly together, holding me between them, this mystifyingly white child of theirs. <laughs> but full of love, full of love. And I love those stories, and I think every family has got a story like this, where if someone is unwrapping a story, and they have, they have a meaning to, to give you from the story, but what's really interesting is not what they're trying to tell you, but the fragments of meaning that fall out of the paper as they're unwrapping it. And my mother used to tell this story about our dog, Misha, and what a great dog he was in Papua New Guinea, and how he roamed the uh, boundary of the, of the property and kept out, uh, outsiders uh, away. And then, um, but obviously, I, you know, the dog had been there for a long time before I finally arrived through whatever method. Uh, and the dog was terribly jealous. And so when I was one year old, the dog pounced and got me full head in its muzzle and tried to shake me to death. And just, in, you know, they rushed me to the hospital and I frankly nearly died, but it was all fine in the end. But the authorities, such as they were in Papua New Guinea, said, the dog's nearly killed a baby, the dog must be put down, and the dog was put down. And, you know, when my mother would tell that, she would tell it with a particular story, meaning to tell, a meaning to convey, which I think was that she'd lost a perfectly good dog. Um, <laughs> But what's always interesting about these stories is the thing they don't tell you. And the, the question with that story for me was, well, if the dog was jealous, why did it wait until I was a year old to pounce? And the answer was, she told me, oh, well, she said, as if everyone knew this, well, Darnota never put you down until then. And so this is the traditional method of child rearing in Papua New Guinea. It is close and physically bonded. I don't think I'd left her arms, really, for that first year of my life. So how lucky am I? How lucky am I? I had this strange and different mother, but I had this perfect mother uh, as an alternative. Um, you go on through your life uh, at that point and you try to make these bonding moments again with your children and the, and the grandmother. I, I remember particularly a bit later on when, when the, the 10 day old baby was four years old, my mother again came into the house and you know, whenever she came to our house, she was all very concerned about germs. Um, and she used to wear these white gloves, which, and as she came up the hallway in our place, she'd always be tightening them, <laughs> as if to repel the germs of our household. And I remember this particular morning um, saying, uh, you know, the old, the old, our older son was about seven and we needed to take him to school. And I said to my mother, you know, could you just look after Joe? Just put him in front of television with some Vegemite toast. We'll be five minutes and we'll be back. And I remember her, um, uh, I got this from both parties to the incident. <laughs> which was that she came into the room and he hadn't eaten the toast. And she said, Joe, you must eat your toast, otherwise I'll cry and cry. She used to do this hysterical sort of sounding like the Queen Mother voice and this fake crying all the time, leaving me the perfectly well-rounded person you see before. <laughs> um, and she swept out of the room and then she swept back in and, and the toast was gone. And she said, good boy, Joe, you've eaten the toast. And Joe said, I haven't eaten it. I've hidden it. <laughs> and you can imagine for a woman with OCD, with, with, for a woman with germ phobia, the idea that there was this greasy, vegemite piece of toast somewhere in the room, sending up its little oozy or spores. And by the time we got home, she was on her hands and knees, hair astray, a broken woman. <laughs> Went back home soon after. I said to Joe, where's the toast? And you know that little boy swagger, that four-year-old swagger? He pulled out the toast and presented me with this huge smile. And I thought at that point, you know, growing up, I was never much of a match for my mother. But I've had a role in bringing up someone. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Um, fast forward 
fast forward about 10 years and, you know, they started doing that Ancestry.com stuff on, on television. You get a free trial. For, and I've never been that concerned about my mother's past. And I always thought, oh, you know, leave it alone. Who cares if she makes up this fantastic story? But they were advertising. There was a free trial. So I thought, oh, well, I'll give it a go. Because I, I knew the names of the sisters. Auntie Audrey had told me when she showed me the photograph, Bertha and Molly. And I knew the... So I put them all into, into Ancestry.com and almost instantly, bang, there's the family tree. And Joe's about 14 by this time, and he's walking past. And she's, she's about to come to Christmas lunch, you know. So, and, you know, I've always told them the truth about her past because I didn't want them thinking they were from posh stock. Um, so they always knew the, you know, the truth. Don't say anything, but the truth. <laughs> and I say, oh, Joe, look at this. This is interesting. This is the, the family tree. You know, this is the reality. And you could tell from the family tree, you know, they're all um, uh, mill workers and domestic servants and, you know, this whole... And, he, and Joe looks at it and says... Oh, that's, that's interesting. That's very interesting. We should print that out. <laughs> we should laminate that. <laughs> we should use that as a setting for Christmas lunch. <laughs> <laughs> he, he volunteered to be the one who says, Good news, Nana Anna, we've found your family. <laughs> um, how do you... Um, when you've got a lack of a strange mother, and I had a strange father as well, you have this kind of lack of maternal love at the centre of your life. And it's a very hard thing to get your mind around, I think, partly because of the language we use to describe this lack of parental love. We talk about it as if it's inexorable, that every mother loves their child and every father loves their child. This is automatic. It's inexorable. Uh, we all get it. If you didn't get it, you're... You know, it's really rare, you're uniquely hard done by, you've got a right to feel aggrieved, you'll probably have a terrible life yourself, you certainly can't be a good parent. That's the way we talk about it. We even have a language about, you know, that it's built into our DNA for mothers to love their children. We talk about cats and their kittens, car cows and their cards. This is, you know, nature itself thrums with this sort of love. That's the way we talk. And yet here's an interesting experiment, which we could play right now if you want. You know, who here feels that they got the love from their parents that they would want to give a child of their own. Now, who feels they got that? And I, you know, I'm predicting it will be about half. It's usually about half. Maybe, maybe a bit more than half. Maybe 60% of people think that they... You know, parents weren't perfect, but they got the kind of love that they would want to get from a child of their own. So that's the interesting thing. Around 40% of us didn't. So it's not rare at all. And yet most of us are not mad and drug addicted and on heroin and stealing from the local service station. Most of us go on to live these good lives and most of us go on to be good parents, even though we've missed out, even though such a large number of people have missed out. And that's because of this amazing resilience of human beings, that somehow we find the love elsewhere. We miss out here, but we find it there. We find it in the most unexpected places. We have one bad parent, but the other parent is good. We have two bad parents, but our children are fantastic. We've been lucky there. Our children are fantastic and our parents are fantastic, but the, we've happened to have got a really toxic boss and we can't leave the company. We navigate our way around these things. Most of us. I mean, so obviously some childhoods are so terrible, you cannot navigate around them. They're just terrible. They're so poisonous. It is hard not to be crippled by them. But for most of us, there is this great resilience of human beings, this great resilience whereby we find the love elsewhere. And that's really what this book is a call to arms about, is to not feel that we are trapped in whatever painfulness we came from. It's a book about using humour to try to confront those things. And it's really about, and you know, these are my own eccentric stories, but almost everybody who's read this book so far, or anyway, the people I've talked to anyway, have said that the book was really an invitation for them to visit their own childhood and their own parenting. And I've had lots of letters from people who've described the process of reading the book as being ripping bandages off their own flesh wounds and it being a bloody process, but a really useful process. I'd love you to, um, to, to uh, buy a copy and, and, and read it, of course, today. Um, <laughs> if, um, the, only, the only thing I'd say, you know, because I work at the ABC and, and, and the, our audience is full of, of, of grammar pedants and pronunciation pedants who are always giving me a hard time. And... and you know, I'm not sure, but if you do take home the book and you, and you read it and you, you find some terrible grammatical error, I, I do want you to be sympathetic. You know, it's a happiness conference. <laughs> and I want you to think, yes, yes, well, that's a terrible mistake Richard's made. 
But then again, if his mother hadn't run off with his English teacher. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.